but I'm going to be reading the beginning of Genesis and then the very end of that section. So Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was formless and void and darkness covered the face of the deep while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And then jumping to chapter 2, verse 4a. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me, please? Lord, open our hearts to your word. Open our hearts to what you would have us learn. And then let us go from this place, proclaiming your good news. Amen. Have you ever wondered why sometimes in Scripture there is that little A or B or C at the end of the passage? John, have you ever wondered that? <laughs> As he tried to put that in today. Our total passage today is actually Genesis 1-1 through Genesis 2, verse 4a. That A means that there's part of the verse that comes to a conclusion, there's usually a period or a semicolon or something that marks the end of the verse. As some of you know by now, Presbyterian ministers are classic overachievers. We must take both Greek and Hebrew as part of our seminary training. As I understand it, just about every other denomination, you get your choice of one or the other, Presbyterians, we have to do it all, so we take both of them. I took Hebrew during my summer, during the summer term at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, and I have to tell you, it was a very long and hot summer trying to learn that silly language. We spent the entire term translating one chapter of the Bible. Any guesses? Genesis 1-1 through Genesis 2, 4, A. And I thought it was really, I'll say silly instead of stupid, that you would stop translating in the middle of a verse. What's wrong with 2, 4, B? Why translate to A? But look at your Bibles, check them. You're going to have a period at 2, 4, A. Then there's another thought, and then you get into verse 5. So when I finish 2-4-A, this is the account of heavens and earth when they were created, period, end of sentence, I said to myself, self, why not translate 4-B? They, they said I shouldn't, therefore I will. <laughs> and I very quickly discovered that they, whoever they are, knew what they were talking about, because when I translated for B, I could not translate it. I couldn't even get the first word straight. I knew it was Hebrew. I aced the class. And yet it was a very different Hebrew. The author of 2, 4, B and following is not the same author as Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 4, B, 2, 4, A. Please hear that. It is a very important piece of information. The person who wrote Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 4, A is not the same author as Genesis 2, 4, B and the following. And I have to tell you, when I discovered that, because I did the translation, totally freaked me out. 
because everything I understood about the Bible or thought I understood about the Bible just went right down the tubes. I now need to pay a lot more respect and a lot more attention to those scholars who really dig into the Bible in the original languages. I have to take much more seriously than I ever did before those scholars who try to figure out why Yahweh is used for God in one place, why Elohim is used for God in another, why El Shaddai is used in another, why all of these different names of God are used when and why they are. The other thing that got me wondering is, okay, who wrote? Who authored Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 4, A, period? Who wrote Genesis 2, 4, B and the following, and why? Being the Presbyterian overachiever, I started in my research to try to understand what was going on. And it turns out that Genesis 2, 4, B and the following was written roughly five to 700 years before chapter one. Genesis 2 was written before Genesis 1. You just have to trust me on that one until you do your own research. Genesis 1 was written during the exile of the Hebrew people in Babylon sometime after 587 B.C. when they were all exiled. Chapter 2 was written around 1100 B.C. It's really hard to be a lot more accurate than that because we're dealing with stuff that was written over 3,000 years ago in a language that didn't use vowels, punctuation, or spaces. The Old Testament is one long run-on sentence. This is just some of the stuff that scholars are dealing with as they're getting back into the original language and those ancient manuscripts to understand what's going on. So we need to understand what the exile meant to the Hebrew people. If you remember, God had promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob a promised land. He had promised to give them a place to live. And the promised land had been the hope of the Hebrew people for centuries. If you remember the story of Joseph, who had been sold into slavery and shipped off to Egypt where he became one of the had muckety-mucks of the Egyptian empire at that time. At the end of Genesis, he, as he was dying, he told his brothers, God will surely come to you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. Being displaced in Egypt for 400 years did not negate the promise of God. The promised land was a promise God made and God would fulfill in God's time for God's chosen people. We then have Moses and the Exodus story as they fled Egypt and then wandered around the desert for 40 years until they entered Canaan, the land that God had promised. It is estimated that they entered into the land of Canaan about 1200 B.C., and it is during this time that the second chapter of Genesis was written. Chapter 2 was written by people who experienced the promise. It is written by those who entered into the promised land, and they lived there for about 600 years. Jump forward about 600 years to 610 B.C., when Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire showed up on the scene, and the Hebrew people lived in fear of them. Shoot, the entire area lived in fear of Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar. And then finally, in 587 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar came in, wiped out Jerusalem, leveled the temple, polluted the land, and took the best of the best people into exile back in Babylon, leaving everybody else in Israel to fend for themselves. Now, the question that kept running through the mind of the people there in exile in Babylon was, are we still God's people? 
This is a critical question for them. They knew they were God's people when they lived in God's promised land. We're not in God's promised land. Are we still God's people? This is where Psalm 137 comes from. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and there we wept when we remembered Zion. How can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? They didn't know if they could worship God in Babylon. They didn't know if they could sing praises to God in a foreign land because maybe they were no longer God's chosen people because they were no longer in the promised land. The land gave them their identity, and now their land was destroyed. Was God destroyed as well? Was Marduk, the chief god of the Mesopotamian people, stronger than Yahweh, who led them out of Egypt and gave them the land of Canaan? Was there still a god to be worshipped? And even if there was, can we worship God in Babylon? and not when they're not in the land promised to them. These are, the, these are the questions they're struggling with. And so what did they do? They sat down by the rivers of Babylon, and they thought, and they prayed, and they wondered, and they argued with each other until someone finally started to put down their thoughts. And someone wrote, in the beginning, God. To understand their predicament now, they went back to the very beginning as best they could, and lo and behold, there was God. In the midst of the chaos, chaos at the beginning of time, and the chaos they were currently living in there in Babylon, there was God. The first chapter of Genesis was not written as a treatise against the theory of, revo of evolution. It was not written as a way of, of supporting and promoting the theory of creationism. Chapter 1 of Genesis is an affirmation that in the very chaos of our lives, God is present. When the very worst that could possibly happen to us becomes a reality, God is present. God is the one who brings order and meaning out of chaos. When God enters into the chaos of our lives, it is a creative moment and a new day dawns. God enters into the chaos of our lives and we are graced and order is restored. As I read, the first act of creation was what? Light. First act of creation was light and separating the light from the darkness. Please remember, sun and moon are not created for another, I think, three days. Light, God's light, was the first act of creation. That's why light has always been a symbol for God. God is in the business of creating light and removing darkness. When God in love removes the darkness of our sins from our lives, light shines and morning breaks anew. Can you hear the song? Morning has broken like that first morning. As we read that entire first chapter of Genesis, Day by day, God looked at what was created, and God blessed it, and he called it good. The problem is we, God's creatures, seem to be taking God's good creation, and we try to return it to its original chaotic state. We abuse creation. We abuse ourselves. We abuse one another. We abuse God's plan of living in harmony and relationship with God and one another. 
And yet, like those in exile, we discover at the very center of the chaos of our lives that God is present. And God, even today, is still in the creating business. In Jesus, God became human and lived among us. In Jesus, God reclaims creation one person at a time. In God, in Jesus, God's realm is being established here on earth. In Jesus, we witness the good of creation and we see morning breaking day after day like that first morning. In Jesus, we proclaim that life and creation is good. In Jesus, we await God's fulfillment of God's promises just as the Hebrew people waited to enter into that promised land. My friends, in the midst of the chaos of our lives, God is present. God's light is shining. Praise be to God.